Corinne Sanders, Saunders, part two. <laughs> Corinne has a, a lengthy history of dealing with antiques and antique jewelry that started when she was a student working in an antique shop in London. They, this experience stimulated her interest in antiques and their history, particularly antique jewelry. Corinne still pursues her love of antiques and jewelry with her husband Jeff and their daughter Erica in the family bu business La Vogue Vintage. Please join me in welcoming back Corinne Saunders. Good evening everybody. The continuation of silver and its importance in history. The first uh, picture that's up on the screen is quite hectic and it reflects the rather hectic um, embellishment of this beautiful fruit set. It's actually a Tiffany set. I will talk about Tiffany a little later on. But I selected this as a contrast to those two elegant um, but very simple coffee pots that I opened the previous presentation with, just to give you a contrast of, of just how beautiful you can make silver. I'm just going to recap very quickly. I have to talk quickly because it still is quite long. Um, but just to recap briefly, on part one of this presentation, I looked at the importance of silver <coughs> with regard to its uh, growing availability. And um, it was particularly with the discovery of vast deposits in the New World, and later on up to the 16th century, and then in the 19th century, further huge deposits were found in North America, Australia, Mexico, and many other locations and many other locations worldwide, including Canada. There are many properties that make <coughs> silver attractive. It's malleable, it's ductile. Remember the piece of wire that um, we drew to, I think it was 40 kilometers long from a small one ounce block of silver. It has that ability. It's self-sterilizing in that bacteria do not grow on the surface of silver. It's much lighter than other precious metals, so that um, is a great advantage when you're making sil uh, silverware. To make a teapot of solid gold, as compared to solid silver, the teapot would weigh probably about two-thirds more than the silver piece. So once it had tea in it, it would be quite a feat to lift. It's a highly reflective um, metal. And that's used to great advantage, um, as you will hear later on. It's too soft for everyday use, but can be easily alloyed with copper in different ratios to produce a more enduring, yet still very workable metal. The sterling silver is used, the sterling standard is used throughout the USA and Canada and Great Britain. <coughs> And sterling silver consists of 725 parts, or 92.5% silver, and the other 75% uh, is copper. Decorative finishes are very easy to apply. It's a very workable metal for silversmiths. And you can see here some, a couple of nice examples the round platter which is richly um, embossed, well with repoussé work actually, and then the, the bowl at the bottom has cut card um, silver decor, decoration which is pieces of silver that are cut out and applied to the surface of the finished article. The British hall marking system was started or was started to be developed around about 1300 AD with the introduction of the leopard's head as a mark of the required legal quality, that is sterling silver. In 1544, the lion replaced the leopard head as the sterling mark. Um, and on your, the screen, you can see the little lion. You've got the maker's mark first, then the lion, and then you have the leopard's head. In this case, it's crowned because it was about a hundred year period in history when, when he was born. Um, but today we don't see it with that crown on anymore. 
And then on this particular hallmark, you have the date letter, which enables you to uh, date the piece, piece precisely to the year. And then here, there's a, um, a figure of the figurehead of George III, um, which was stamped on some of the silver to indicate that people had paid the required duty that was also um, introduced for about a hundred year period, I think, to fill the government coffers. Today, only four assay offices remain. That's London, Sheffield, Birmingham, Edinburgh, and then one in Southern Ireland, Dublin. <coughs> Originally, there had been 10. And from 1975, all the offices now use the same date letter and style, and this changes every year. Today, I want to continue with other techniques that were used to make decorative and domestic items. The first one of these is old Sheffield plate, which you should not confuse with Sheffield plated. And I'll explain that later. British plate, close plate, Britannia metal, again, don't confuse it with Britannia silver, two quite different things. And then finally, electroplating. I'm just going to skip a couple of pictures here first. Um, old Sheffield plate, <coughs> Um, is a process that was discovered by a man, Thomas Bolsover, in 1742. And it was a technique whereby a sheet of silver was fused by heat onto a thicker sheet of copper, often in the as an ingot, in fact, of copper. The fused sheet was then rolled and made into small objects, such as buttons and boxes at that time, that had a silver finish on but weren't solid silver. So they were able to compete effectively on price with sterling silver, and because of that, it soon came into demand. I just want to go back quickly here. This is a, an old drawing of a Sheffield plate workshop. The man on the left-hand side, you can see, is pouring the molten copper into the moulds for the ingots. There's a little pile of ingots on the table there, bound um, together. The, that is, the silver and the copper are bound together, ready to go into the furnace at the back to be heated, to fuse the, copper on, uh, the silver onto the copper, and then finally the man on the right-hand side is polishing those bars once the press has, has been finished. And just a closer look at those bars, the top um, left-hand one is the, the copper... Um, ingot with just the layer of silver lying on it and then the one on the right hand side you can see how the, the, they're strapped together to hold the silver onto the copper before it's uh, put into the furnace and fused and then the bottom one is the completed um, bar before it's rolled and that has been polished and finished and here I'm, I apologize it's not a steam powered lathe at all um, the picture on the left is actually a rolling mill. It's rolling out the um, ingots into sheet. And this is a, a highly mechanised one. In fact, this photograph was taken in 1987. So it's, it's an old technique, but it's still carried out today. And then the man on the right-hand side, he's operating manually a fly press. This photograph is from about 1900. And what he is doing, he's under, at the bottom, he has got a mould, a form of, say, a bowl, and then the, um, the, the plated, uh, the copper, silver plated copper is put over that, and then the fly press comes down, and the pressure, gra he does it many times, it gradually moulds the metal onto the shape. Now this is a picture of a saucepan, um, and the outside of it is copper, and the inside is silver. Now what has happened here, well in fact right from the, the beginning, uh, Old Sheffield, um, the, the silver was only applied on the one side. And because copper does, you know, the taste of copper taints the food, um, 
the, the silver side was always put to the inside of the saucepan, and cookware was made uh, like this for quite a few hundred years. This piece in particular dates from 1750, as you can see. The, once they had managed to um, put the, the silver on both sides, the copper, well, they'd worked out how to do it. Um, a very enterprising silversmith from Birmingham, Matthew Bolton, took the technique to new heights. He was quite smart, he made a lot of money from it, and um, is very well known for his old Sheffield plate. Now this is a bread basket from 1777. And this is at a time when they had worked out how to coat both sides of the, the copper ingot, so that when it was rolled into sheet, we now had a sheet that effectively was like a sandwich with copper in the middle and then a slice of silver each side. And you had to, they had to reach that point in order to make pieces like this where you, had, where you were able to see both sides of, of the item. The finished hue of Sheffield plate was comparable to silver itself, as the sheet used was sterling, different to the much harder colour of electro plate that was still to come. Um, the electro plating technique actually used pure silver, whereas old Sheffield used sterling, and it just had that much more mellow tone to it. Eventually, with cleaning and polishing, the copper began to show through the silver. This was known as bleeding. But collectors generally find this very appealing, and one should never, ever be tempted to electroplate old Sheffield plate, because you just completely destroy its value. And this is a rather beautiful uh, toast rack yep. made from the uh, Sheffield plate. But here they've worked out now how to make wire. So they've completely coated the wire uh, with the copper in the middle, and that has enabled them to make this rather attractive piece. The bottom, of course, would still be the normal plate, flat plate. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm oh, sorry about these pictures, it's, it's from a book. Um, the right-hand sh side shows a water jug made from Sheffield plate. This was made by um, Matthew Bolton uh, in the late 18th century. And then the one on the left, which you can see a little clearer there, um, was made by another silversmith, but in the same period. And you can see the standard of workmanship and decoration was quite remarkable. And I think this is the thing. We tend to think that silver demands the craftsmanship, but so often the craftsmanship was not spared, even if the metal itself was not so precious. Okay, now we'll just move on to the next, oh, <coughs> sorry, before we go any further. This little piece here is a cucumber slicer. Now the gadget, uh, the Victorians loved gadgets, and this was a very neat little machine that every well-dressed tea table would have, one hopes. Um, and what they did, they, slide, they peeled the cucumber, it was placed in the cylinder, and then at the end is a blade which was turned, so that you have freshly sliced cucumber at the table to put onto your thinly sliced bread. I've never seen one myself, I'm sure they're quite rare now. Um, and this is another little gadget, um, a little carriage for the coasters, which held the wine bottles. So you could then send the carriage down the table and people could either help themselves to a glass of wine, or, though I'm sure at that time the butler probably did it for you, but nevertheless the, the bottles went down the table mechanically. And this, uh, this is a little bit of self-indulgence. I had to include this because this is a piece very similar to one that we had through our hands about 15 years ago. I don't know if anybody here knows what it is, but we certainly didn't know what it was when it came to us, and we asked Everybody we knew in the trade, including the top evaluators, um, 
in the country at the time, and nobody could come up with an answer. And then we had a light bulb moment when we were watching a film, Master and Commander, with Russell Crowe. And in that film, he's sitting in his cabin one evening, and the cook comes in, carrying one of these. And he took it and opened the lid in front of the fire. And what this is, is a cheese melter. And the cavity at the bottom is filled with hot water. And the one that we had actually had an additional piece of metal, which you also heated and then put into the water to maintain the heat. And then the slices of cheese are put into the little compartments that you can see there. It's carried then to wherever it has to go to. And then the lid is opened in front of the fire. And because the inside of the lid is highly polished, it reflects the heat and just toasts the top of your cheese for you. <laughs> Having found out what it was, we then felt that, well, we could sell it, which we did. And we have regretted it ever since, as I've never seen another one. <laughs> British plate, now this is something completely different, is composed of nickel silver, which is an alloy of copper, zinc, and nickel, and contains no silver whatsoever. It's a complete misnomer. It was first used as an extra layer between copper and, and silver in the production of old Sheffield plate from about 1830. And the advantage of that was that it had, um, it showed a dull gray color once the silver started to wear. So you didn't get this huge contrast between the silver and the copper showing through. It was now just a sort of muted grayish color, which I suppose they thought was more acceptable. And the articles themselves are often stamped BP, denoting a British plate. Close plate was the only way of silver plating steel. The articles were first made in steel, and then they were dipped in sal ammoniac, which acted as a flux, and then into molten tin, so that it was completely covered. And then a piece of silver foil was cut to the shape of the item, and it was folded over the piece, and then a heated soldering iron was then rubbed over the surface of the item, thus melting the underlying tin, and uniting the steel and the silver. I don't know who worked that out. The marks consist of different shields uh, containing the maker's initials and registered marks. And that's why we have this picture here. Brad Bradshaw, um, the, the top mark is nothing to do with it. Bradshaw, you can see the single um, mark. That was how he stamped his old Sheffield plate. <coughs> But close plate was often double struck, and you can see that there, the two Bradshaws and the two, um, some sort of pliers that, that, that he has there. The letters PS are also sometimes stamped on to plated steel. And of course the best way to detect if your piece is plated steel is to use a magnet. Now, Britannia metal, sorry, is an interesting um, metal. It's a type of pewter made with tin and antimony, which initially gives the appearance of silver, but over time, the surface oxidizes to turn dark gray. And we have a little blotter here, actually, that is a piece of Britannia. You, you'll see that grayness coming through. The alloy was developed as a cheap, cheaper alternative to old Sheffield plate. Um, Oh, sorry, I have to keep hitting the buttons here. Um, as a cheaper alternative to Sheffield plates, because that technique was quite labour intensive, so it did make it expensive. But around 1864, it was discovered that it could be very successfully silver plated. And this was a big turning point in the trade, and by 1880, most of the factories around Sheffield had converted to silver plating and even some of the earlier uh, Britannia metal pieces <coughs> were then subsequently electroplated. And unlike um, old Sheffield, it, there doesn't seem to be the outcry about now electroplating Britannia metal. 
um, and it doesn't affect the value. The advent of electroplating brought about the demise of, Britannia, of the manufacture of Britannia metal on a large scale, although some companies such as James Dixon and Sons continued to make high quality electroplated Britannia metal wares. It is still produced today, and perhaps the most famous items, as you can see, are the Oscar statuettes, which are gold plated Britannia metal. Oh, way, sorry. Way I, far ahead I keep, um, I do apologise, I keep hitting the keyboard here. Okay. Um, okay, I said earlier that Britannia metal should not be confused with Britannia silver, which, if you recall from the first um, presentation, is actually silver which has been alloyed <coughs> to a higher standard than sterling. It is actually 95. 0.8% sterling, uh, silver, sorry, as opposed to 92.5% silver, which of course is the sterling standard. And it was introduced in an attempt to stop the practice of clipping coins to obtain silver for manufacturing purposes, because eventually the coinage was just reduced to smaller and smaller little chips. And these pieces are usually stamped with the letters EPBM, um, to donate electroplated Britannia metal. Okay, now we can go on to electroplate. This eventually became the method of choice for the production of less expensive silverware by the early 1840s. It was, in fact, a true child of the Industrial Revolution because up until that point they hadn't really had the skills to develop the techniques or the machinery required. There were many initial technical problems, such as getting the silver to coat the item evenly over the whole surface, and in getting the silver to adhere permanently. By 1842, however, Elkington and Co. in Birmingham, in England, had perfected this process, now known as electroplating. And this actually is um, a picture of Elkington's um, electroplating works, rather grand <coughs> entrance there in that middle photograph, and then several um, uh, depictions of the various techniques used. And in the top right hand corner, those people standing on the balcony, the middle one is actually the Prince of Wales. Um, he did a tour of the facility at that time because it was all very exciting and all very new. The article to be electroplated was placed in a solution of potassium cyanide with a negative pole attached to it. The positive pole was attached to a 100% pure silver sheet and the low voltage current passed through the solution, causing the silver sheet acting as a cathode to produce silver ions which were deposited onto the article. The longer the item remained in the bath, the thicker the coating of silver. And when the item was removed from the vat, it was gently hammered over the surface to make sure that the silver coating had in fact ad adhered uh, correctly. And in this picture you can see that the size of the bars that were required, um, and it, it became really quite, quite a production line, um, bringing these things through. The large vats were lined with Portland cement and had to be kept extremely clean because you couldn't afford to have any uh, pieces of dirt that, that could damage the surface of, of the item to be plated because you wanted to give it a really um, good polish at, at the end. And in fact, the whole plating process itself had to be kept extremely clean. Traditional silversmithing techniques were employed to make the articles, which could be engraved and decorated before plating. And the variety of electroplated wares produced was far in excess of those made from old Sheffield plate. The most common base metals used were Britannia metal, uh, the nickel silver, copper, brass, and um, British plate. The major disadvantage, um, aesthetically, of the electroplating technique was that because pure silver was used, it could not attain the patina of sterling silver that old Sheffield plate could. And 
people did not find that terribly appealing initially, that, you know, this bright, shiny finish. And on the right-hand side here, you can see some stamps um, used to mark James Dixon's pieces in the, uh, during the late 18th and um, then on into the 19th century. The bottom mark and the top one are both Sheffield, old Sheffield plate marks, and then the middle two are <coughs> more recent in the latter part of the 19th century. And the little picture there of the trumpet became their registered um, picture mark. So you, if you saw that mark, even if it didn't have the name Dixon there, you knew that it, it was theirs. The stamps that are found on electroplated goods are many and varied, and they usually um, also had a stamp on them saying EPNS, EPBM for Britannia Metal, and EPCU, uh, that silver plate on copper. Victorian silver plated items have become very collectible now, as the quality was generally very high, and because of their age, the silver plating has in fact mellowed, and now has a quite attractive finish when, when compared to the modern um, bright silver, uh, modern silver plated colouring. So I think a lot of people tend to dismiss silver plate no matter what the age, but you shouldn't do that. Some of the pieces, if the makers are good and the quality is there, they're 19th century, even earlier if you're lucky, they are worth considering for your collection or um, if you are a dealer um, of buying to resell. And here you can see just a few of the, um, the different items that could be made. I mean, there are hundreds, of course. Okay. Now I want to talk briefly about Canadian and American silversmiths because you're more likely to see those here in Canada. Most early Canadian silversmiths were based in Montreal and Quebec, <coughs> and they handmade items in the English and French styles, and they were sold from small retail shops. These small businesses were gradually replaced by larger firms after the Industrial Revolution, um, because using mechanical techniques uh, enabled production in much larger quantities. The English style still prevailed, although they were gradually influenced by American companies such as Gorham and Tiffany. Perhaps the most influential Canadian silverware manufacturing company was Henry Burks and, and Co., which started life as a retail jeweller in Montreal in 1879. By 1893, three sons had joined the business, forming Henry Burks and Sons, and in 1897, Burks brought out their largest silverware suppliers, Hendry and Leslie, and started manufacturing their own goods. 1897 also saw the launch of their magazine, which was entitled 1897, and they still produce that today. It's a biannual publication with obviously lots of um, promotional things in, um, but interesting news items as well. By the mid-20th century, Burks had brought out many established jewellers across the country and also took over rival manufacturing companies until they had a virtual monopoly. They produced hollowware and flatware in Montreal until the early 1990s when the factory closed. Then they also sold UK and US manufactured goods <coughs> under their own name. Burke's Silver Marks 1879 to 1897 was in fact the retailer's stamp, HB and Co. After 1897, when they were manufacturing themselves, the name Burke's was added, together with pseudo marks of a lion rampant, sovereign's head, and a date letter. Um, sorry, I missed one. Yeah, here we go. Sorry, I missed, I've jumped one. And you can see that on the right-hand side. The, um, oh, sorry, that's the, um, you've got the sovereign's head there, you've got a date letter, and you've got the little lion. So they're trying very hard to replicate the English system. 
um, but it was in fact nothing to do with that. Although, having said that, Burke somehow in 1925 managed to obtain permission from the London Assay Office to add a date stamp to correspond with the London cycle date stamp. I don't know how they did that. Because obviously the piece didn't go to London to be assayed, which it should have done. Anyway, it's quite a coup for them. Then the later marks, they, they were very early in introducing the, the sterling stamp, as indeed was Tiffany's in America. Um, and these were two of their earlier marks. I've not seen the one on the left hand side very often, but certainly you do see pieces around with, the, with that mark on the, the right hand side. 1920, William Burks introduced this blue box, which became quite iconic. They made all their packaging like this, with different marks. In fact, well, I had a couple of boxes, I didn't bring them, I'm afraid. Um, <coughs> on these two, well, the one on the right-hand side is the, the, the easiest one to see, the, Berling, uh, the Burks mark. They've introduced here the Canadian mark. Well, it was known as the, Nas the Canadian national mark, with the letter C with the lion's head inside it. Previously, this happened in about 1925, previously uh, the Canadian mark was a beaver. In 1934, they, in they introduced the national mark for items of precious metal that were wholly manufactured in Canada. You couldn't have any foreign pieces in there. Initially, it was the lion's head inside the letter C, but in 1978, that changed to a maple leaf inside the letter C. <coughs> and this, in fact, is the, the current mark uh, that you see today. On the right-hand side here, um, is a, a warrant. They made a presentation um, to, um, no, they didn't make a res presentation. Edward VII actually issued a royal warrant to Burke's when he was a Prince of Wales. This was quite an honour. I think there were one or two Canadian companies that did receive this honour, um, and Burke's was one of them. The massive expansion of Burke's throughout the 20th century, which included the purchase of the retail chain Mayers in North America, gradually seemed to overstretch the company, and it filed for bankruptcy in 1993. <coughs> John Burke's sold um, to an Italian company, the Regalux Group, who began to reset their sights back to the global luxury brand and that's still their goal today. I think what happened, reading between the lines, I, it's my own interpretation, um, by taking over so many retail outlets, Burks had to increase their sales and they couldn't do it just in the luxury market. They had to appeal, um, have a much wider appeal. And through that, they gradually lost their focus, sadly. What is the connection here? Well, this is a picture of Prince Harry announcing his engagement to Meghan Markle. And the connection is that she's wearing a pair of Burke's earrings. And they are these opal and 18 karat gold earrings that you can see on the left-hand side. Now, whether that's just a massive marketing coup, I don't know, or whether she bought them when she lived in Toronto, but now those opal earrings are one of their biggest sellers. Other prominent silversmiths um, include this man, Peter Ellis. He, was he established himself in Toronto in 1879, producing hollowware and flatware, again in the English style, taken over by Burks in 1928. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Roden or Rodden brothers established in Toronto in 1892, also produced hollowware and flatware in the English style, taken over by Burks in 1953. 
and this one is um, again I don't know how to how you say it Rari or Rari Brothers established in Toronto in 1897 they sold hollowware and flatware but they didn't make it themselves they didn't manufacture it taken over by Burks in 1905. <coughs> Carl Paul Peterson was apprenticed to Georg Jensen in Denmark and then emigrated to Canada in 1929, where he worked for Burks in Montreal until 1944, when he opened his own workshop. His work continued to be inspired by Jensen. He greatly admired the, the man, and his things were largely handmade, and they have become arguably the most collectible um, silver pieces in Canada today, pieces that are all made by him. Um, well, not while well, the, the factory is closed now, but um, certainly one of the most collectible silversmiths of the 20th century. And he actually worked on commissions for the NHL and other sporting bodies, and in 1962 he produced the Stanley Cup. The business closed in 1979. William Morris Carmichael was another notable silversmith, but from BC, there weren't a lot of those at the time. He started his business in 1920, producing mainly <coughs> high quality silver plate, although he did make some sterling pieces. He made the Thunderbird and Whale Bowl that was presented to George V by the government of BC. Now, I've not been able, I wanted a, a picture to show you that because it's quite an amazing piece. It's not a huge piece, but it represents a lot of, um, has a lot of First Nation symbolism incorporated into it. And although it was made in the 1920s, it actually has a very modern appeal about it. It's a very lovely piece. That business sadly closed in 1954. And there you can see some of his works. Now, the Americans never actually had a hallmarking system, an assay system. It was only um, the city of Baltimore that from 1814 to 1830 did try to start a system of control and assaying the silver that was produced in their city. And here you can see um, the mark, but it, it didn't last very long, unfortunately. Um, the silversmiths divide their own assurances of quality and identifying marks. There were no federal requirements until 1905. And prior to the introduction um, of sterling silver, or the sterling silver standard in 1868, silver was obtained by melting coins which could vary in purity anything from 750 parts silver to 900 parts silver. So you could buy a piece of silverware, but never really be sure how much silver was in it. <coughs> These items were made um, and sometimes marked coin or pure coin or dollar, indicating that silver was, was used from melted silver dollars. After 1907, the sterling or 92 five mark was required by law as a guarantee of 925 purity. So now they were controlling that if you said it was sterling, you had to stamp it and stand by your word. The tea set here is made from coin silver. And again, you can see that the craftsmanship is still exceptional. And we can't talk about silver, uh, American silversmiths without mentioning Paul Revere, and he of course made the celebrated, probably the most celebrated piece of American silver, the Sons of Liberty Bowl, which is now in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And here you can see his stamps on the left hand side, and then just on the right hand side that was a porringer that he made, but he was a very skilled silversmith. But that wasn't all he did. He did had several other trades as well. Interesting man. 
Other well-known American silversmiths include the Alvain Silversmithing Company, established in 1886, and that was eventually bought out by Gorham. And you can see their mark there. The Carlo shop um, in Chicago was quite well known. It was um, started by a lady, Clara Back Wells, and they were proponents of the arts and crafts movement, which meant that everything was handmade. It was a movement that wanted to restore uh, mechanization back to traditional craftsmanship. And then underneath their marks um, is Rogers and Britain, um, which was founded by Edwin Britton in 1873. And they eventually um, merged with a couple of other companies and came to form a group known as the International Silver Company in 1898 and consolidated to become the Meridian in 1933. John Rudolph Gwent was the founder of John Vent & Co and Rogers and & Vent of Boston, whose items have also become very collectible today, and there's one of his marks at the top. Kirk and Smith, uh, Kirk and Smith Sterling were founded in 1815, and they were a combination of two America's prominent silver companies, which were eventually incorporated in 1979 as the Kirk Stife Company. So those are both marks that you could probably still collect. Reed and Barton, started by Isaac Rabbit, Babbitt in 1824 in Taunton, Massachusetts, <clears throat> has been a major American silversmithing company of the 19th and 20th century and is still owned by the family today. They originally produced silver-plated Britannia metal and they still manufacture silver and silver-plated hollowware and flatware today. The Gorham Manufacturing Company was established in 1831 on Rhode Island and became one of the largest silversmithing companies in the world with an annual turnover, and this was in the very early years, of a million dollars, something that was absolutely unheard of at the time. They were commissioned to make the Davis Cup <coughs> tennis trophy and also the Nixon White House table service in 1975. And some of their original flatware designs are still in production today. And last but by no means least, Tiffany and Company was established in 1837 by Charles Louis Tiffany and John Young as Tiffany and Young. In 1851, they became the first American firm to introduce the Sterling Standard. And all their pieces, and let's just go on ahead, are marked uh, Sterling Silver. And they, were, they have been for 100 years or more. I've actually bought um, a book there, which was published to celebrate their 150 year anniversary in 1987. Um, and you can see there some of the beautiful silverware that they made, beautifully decorated in the style of that first picture that I showed you. And just to go back to these two boxes, on the left, Burks, and on the right, Tiffany. Lots of controversy now because Burks have stores in America and they both have blue boxes. So there's been an awful lot of litigation and back and forth. To my knowledge, it hasn't been resolved. Um, but I do stand to be corrected there. My last reference was 2014. Um, I don't know how they could solve that problem because both those boxes or that packing generally is iconic and a very clever marketing tool. Anyway, enough for now. Thank you for listening. I hope I haven't confused you totally with the different techniques. We have brought one or two samples. I don't have any old Sheffield plates. We do have a couple of pieces, but unfortunately they're in storage at the moment, so I couldn't bring them today. But um, do have a look there. The, the piece with the glass bars is actually a WMF piece. And I think you may not know that here. Um, it's a German company that produced things, uh, well, they're most, famous actually really for their Art Nouveau style pieces. When I say style, they were actually produced
during the Art Nouveau period. And there's a piece there that just shows you some of the exceptional ware that they made. And they used a pewter alloy, which was then silver plated. And you'll see that that one, the silver is almost worn off. It's a piece that does still need to be restored. Um, <coughs> but even though the silver has gone, that dull gray metal is somehow still quite appealing.